Bring it back. Welcome to the Endurance Town USA Project. This podcast, along with our blogs, vlogs, and adventure team, travel around the USA both creating and sharing the stories of human beings, changing lives, and communities through endurance sports and outdoor adventure. Follow us by subscribing today to reconnect and rediscover your own why as we explore the people and the places that make the endurance lifestyle where we call home. This is Endurance Town USA. Bring it back. Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Samantha Pruitt from Endurance Town USA. Welcome to the Endurance Town USA podcast. I'm a life leadership and business coach, and today we're going to talk about some things I'm super passionate about, in particular, emotional fitness. Mm -hmm. And part of a three-part series, um, we're going to talk about making peace with lifestyle choices that can either make or break you. And so I have a guest today, Polly Mertens, who's a good friend of mine and coach, and we're going to talk about making peace with food. Mm -hmm. A little quick blurb on Polly. So Polly is a success mindset coach, uh, speaker, author, and one of my adventure partners. We have a lot of fun together. So today, Polly, in Making Peace with Food, we're going to have you tell us a little bit about your story and then give people some insight and some tools in terms of their own lifestyle choices around food Mm -hmm. and how to um, individually take a look at their relationship with food as well as create a greater sense of peace Mm. with nutrition and lifestyle choices around food. All right. So first, I'd like to hear a little bit about you and your upbringing, if you would share. Well, I'll see if I can do the the streamlined version because I'm nearly 50. um, So (laughs) feeling good. So join the crowd. um, I would say, you know, decent upbringing, you know, like kind of um, I was born in Oakland, California, but at the age of four, my parents moved to New Orleans. So I lived in New Orleans for 10 years, and um, it was great. You know, I mean, it was as best as I knew. And then at 14, we moved back to Oakland. Um, so okay. it was like right in the middle of like that junior high, high school transition. So mm. it was a little, that was a little tricky. tricky like, yeah, it was like, you know, in with friends and had tight relationships and then, you know, just kind of got sucked away to um, back to California. And in living in California, it was like, don't know anybody, creating new relationships. So that was a bit of a, uh, felt the isolation of that. Mm. You know, like, you know how at that age you're trying to find your tribe and find your people. And so it was like additionally hard because I didn't grow up with any of these people. I had, I knew no one, if you will. So um, felt the the loneliness of that. Any siblings? No siblings. Yeah. 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 So much job. job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And parents were, you know, later on I had a a therapist once tell me, well, your parents sound like they were emotionally unavailable. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what are you talking about? And then as I reflected on that, I'm like, yeah, they kind of were. You know, they had their own. My mom was alcoholic, depressive. Um, My dad was in and out of mental institutions when I was younger. So a lot of you know, they were going through their own things, if you will. So I had a lot of freedom and independence, which was great. You know, I grew up quickly, you might say, you know, doing my own laundry, taking care of myself, getting myself to school on two buses, two public buses for an hour, you know, that type of thing, which gave me a lot of great life skills. Wouldn't do it over. Um, But I'd say some of their emotional unavailability led me down some holes to find it in tribes, you know, looking for Mm -hmm. love in lots of places, if you will. Um, So then high school through... Uh, college in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. Okay. And then work and career into Silicon Valley, you know, kind of climbing that ladder, if you will. And about, I think it was shortly after the dot com, like in 2000, I said, you know, I don't want just like this great career because everybody in the San What was your career path? What were you What were you doing? I was doing marketing, so um, okay. sales, marketing. You know, like this was when the dot com was starting, so I worked at some dot com things like that. Mm-hmm. A lot of advertising, marketing, outside sales. And I just looked around at all the people that were living these like super filled, busy lives. And I'm like, there's got to be something else. There's got to be more to life than just career, 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 work. Yes, work, money, career, success. This is what it's supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, you know, this this isn't my path. Um, So I set a goal within two years. I'm like, I'm doing something else. This is going to look way different. And my goal was to get out of the Bay Area. didn't know where to go. Okay. Um, and I actually moved to San Luis Obispo where I... Oh, how old were you? 
just under 30, I think. Or, or okay. Yeah, yeah. I think I entered. So I got my MBA here, and that's what took me down here. As I um, Cal Poly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I got my MBA at Cal Poly mm-hmm. at 30. Said I'm staying in this area. It's so damn beautiful, and so <laughs> worth it. And just you figure it out. And so began a career a little bit in real estate. Then I worked in the solar industry. Um, but I always had this passion on the side um, because I had struggled with food behind all the scenes. Mm, so at that transition okay. when I was 14 and moved um, to back to California, that's when the kind of the bubble started for me. And I can go okay. more into the, the depths of you know how my eating disorder, my disordered eating started. Um, but then um, lived in San Luis Obispo and making a go of it and great career. But in the background, I was working on myself. So I was doing personal development work and I've met a friend of mine and I still consider her just like a pivotal moment for me. She introduced me to a workshop. I went to that workshop and that's when my disordered eating, I left it behind me and I started a new life. So what age was this? 34. 34. 34. Okay. So almost about 16 years now of following this path of improving myself, learning more about myself. And it never ends. You know this, right? Uh, every day. Right. Every damn day. Yeah. Okay. It's not, a, it's not a finish line. Oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> no... I wouldn't want it to be, and neither would you. Yeah. That's yeah. that's a big part of the experience. Yeah. So did you say then around 14 is when mm-hmm. food started to become a bit of a challenge? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I sure can. So as I replay the story in my mind, what I remember is, you know, it was... Um, Food was never like a big thing. I didn't think about it as a kid. You know, it was just growing up, you know, eating hot dogs and mac and cheese with my dad and, you know, that sort of thing. And then, um, you know, about that fitting into the tribe, you know, Mm -hmm. when I got to junior high school and high school, trying to find my tribe, trying to fit in. So I started taking on a lot of the body image, um, like my body's not small enough. I'm not thin enough. You know, I'm not pretty enough. How do I fit into this, to these popular crowds, if Mm -hmm. you will? And um, I was an athlete, so I had been playing volleyball for a number of years and was doing great at that. And what kind of started it, and this is where we'll probably talk some about um, eating disorder awareness or disordered eating awareness, and there's a lot of organizations for that. Well, how I learned about what what I, my path was bulimia. So overeating and then purging it. And in that, I read a magazine in junior high school or something like that and I talked about these Olympic athletes which I aspired to be I was like you know I want to I want to play volleyball and maybe go to the Olympics someday and they're like oh and this is how they can eat whatever they want and still play play their sport it's actually an article in a magazine telling Mm -hmm. these athletes experience around yeah and it was just them sharing their story you know like that's what they were doing and whatnot wow and I said oh well that sounds interesting well how do you do that and I just oh my goodness I figured it out and Mm. um and then I got not hooked but like once you're kind of in the throes of it like this is your your strategy you know Mm -hmm. it was like my success strategy for staying thin if you will Mm -hmm. was oh I can eat whatever I want and then you know, I have this purging going on. So, not great. And you were 14 years old when you discovered this. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then it went on until I was 34. So 20 years. Wow. 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. I look at it back now and I go, oh, that was so long ago. But, man, like at 34, I was like, I have been doing this for 20 years. It just mm-hmm. like hit me how long I had been doing it. Because, you know, there's, there's ebbs and flows, I would say, through mm-hmm. my life. You know, and as people come to me as a coach, some of them, I mean, I've seen lots of different cycles in my own disordered eating mm-hmm. from, you know, 10 times a day. Like I would lock myself in the house with a bunch of food and 10 times a day. And that's all I did, you know, just mm-hmm. and just watch television, eat, you know, it was, you know, trips to the bathroom, not very attractive. So I won't go too much. Into but that. that's when you were in full crisis. Like, yeah. 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 And, and that, you were living alone or people, mm-hmm, okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That that was um, that was actually post-college was probably like, okay. and that was another transition. So a lot of... I was these, curious about that. Yeah. If there were lifestyle changes, obviously growing up, right? Yeah. So junior high and then high school, that transition, mm-hmm. high school into college, yeah. having roommates, having relationships. I'm sure that's part of, yeah. you know, the process yeah. of... And then developing and each, you know, the the, the evolution of it probably tracks very well with, oh, well, you know, I had more flexibility here or I had roommates, so I didn't do it as much or, you know, things like that. So Mm -hmm. were were there people in your life that were aware of what was going on? My mom did find out when I was younger. I think it was about age 16. So I had been doing it a year or so, Mm -hmm. you know, into it. She found out, takes me to Overeaters Anonymous. Okay. We got to see if we can get you some help for this. Okay. And there's a story there. It was beautiful to see other people and to feel 
like, okay, I'm not this freak, you know, like, okay, other people are experiencing this, mm. but that wasn't my path out because it went on for another, you know, 18 years. Right. So, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. 20 years is a long time. I know, girl. Okay. <laughs> right. Prior to that, just out of curiosity, so pre-14 and pre the move from New Orleans back to California, what was your relationship with food? You know, it wasn't, it, it didn't, Nothing it, special? I wouldn't say like it, exi it didn't exist, but mm -hmm. There was, it was never, okay. like, I never saw myself as overweight. I never okay. had an issue with body image, body image, any mm -hmm. of that. Um, I wasn't trying to, you know, I was trying to be cool and fit in, you mm -hmm. know, so I started smoking. Or I was trying to be cool. Right. You right, were smoking. Right. Oh, yeah. So okay. I started smoking because the cool kids mm -hmm. smoked. You this know? is in New Orleans. Yeah. yeah. Mardi Gras. And then, you know, some drinking too going on at that age. Yeah. So yeah. just like trying to fit in and find love, mm -hmm. you know, receive that love that I wasn't getting at home. Mm -hmm. Right. So not Which blaming it on everybody them. does. Yeah. I mean, everybody needs Coping. to have that unconditional love and yeah. acceptance. And if they can't find it in their four walls or in their yeah. family or their friend circle, they're going to go find it out in the world. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And so those fitting in strategies, uh, you know, I, I turned them into food strategies, if you will. Mm. Smoking to look cool, to fit in, um, eating to be thinner, to be accepted. Like, How, how did it affect your athleticism? You know, it didn't. I, I would say it didn't uh, impact mm -hmm. it, but I'm sure there's times where, you know, I, I could have done better, you know, um, if I hadn't been, you know, and those were kind of the younger years. You know, I'd say if I was doing that now, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, it would be much harder, much harder. Did you play sports through college? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I played so volleyball. volleyball. I played volleyball until I was 40. Yeah. So mm. 25 years of volleyball. Um, Dang, competitive, girl. competitive. That's awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, great team. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll make sure I pick you for my uh, rec volleyball. <laughs> <team> when we, <laughs> I love it. We put one together for sure. The 50 plus rec volleyball. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Okay, cool. Well, thanks for sharing all of that. I know, um, you know, everybody has a story and a journey that leads them through life. And for you, it became a big part of your path and your mission is doing this kind of work with other human beings. At what point did you transition out of that? Silicon mindset, and then you said you came to Cal Poly, you got your master's mm -hmm. in, what were you studying business. there? In Absolutely. business, okay, so still on the business track. Mm -hmm. What were you doing when you moved here? You mean like real estate? Well, I just I just um, literally saved up, moved here, uh -huh. and- um, Started over? Yeah, started over from nothing. And Freedom. then I did go into real estate after I graduated from Cal Poly. Because yeah. okay. as you know, back then, 20 years ago in this area, there's not a lot of employers. So <laughs> it wasn't, there still isn't a ton. There is not. Yeah. Small town. Yeah. So it's like, all right, guess we're doing the entrepreneurial thing, which I love. I mean, yeah. I'm an entrepreneur. Oh, you're I'm natural like, at that. Yeah. I'm like, okay, what mm -hmm. are we going to do? So yeah, started real estate and then that morphed into other jobs eventually. So when you moved town again and had to reinvent or recreate a new lifestyle for yourself, how did food come along for the ride like was there a reprieve there or did mm -hmm. it become more of an issue once you had to resettle yeah i would say the peak struggle i had with food was definitely in my early 20s mm. you know it was uh was doing a lot of partying a lot of overeating um just a lot a lot of mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of thing and but i was keeping a career a job you know okay building I, it wasn't um it wasn't interfering with my life. I mean, you know, it would interfere with my weekend, but, you know, on the outside. And this is true for all the clients I've ever seen mm. with eating uh, with bulimia specifically. It's a closet addiction, if you will. You know, it's it's nobody knows that it's happening to them. It's so sad. And that's where they feel so isolated, mm -hmm. you know. And so, you know, as I moved from job to job or work and stuff, no one had any clue. My mom knew when I was younger. I told one other friend okay. when I was in my early 20s, I think. And then no one else, well, maybe they knew. I don't, I don't know. None Roommates, of my, you know. Nothing. No? Yeah, I was, you know, we're super sly. I mean, the, wow. the amount of maneuvering and strategy that goes into it, it's, mm. uh, it's, it, it becomes your full-time job, you know. And that's where a lot of people with, you know, like the momentum of disordered eating, it can be very consuming. Very time consuming, very all consuming. You're thinking about food all the time. You're you're planning for it. You're you know trying to get rid of it. You know whatever it is. Mm. Yeah. Actually, while we're on the subject, can you tell us? So, I know you do coach mm -hmm. disordered eating. Now it is part of your um, repertoire on the coaching world. But yeah. tell us a little bit about the spectrum of disordered eating. What are all the things? I mean, 
Yeah, you know, it would take too long to go into all of that them. That many. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, really, even today, so there's the classic ones that are in therapy guides. You know, you've okay. got anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, you know, things like that. But then I would even say because um, there's so much of this health consciousness in our world today mm. that that amount of <clears throat> kind of health marketing or nutrition marketing, if you will, is creating little mini disordered eating people. Okay. Right? So people are eliminating entire categories of food like oh just don't you know, take that off the plate kind of yeah. thing or they're trying to take in all this information and it's really distorting hey the relationship with their body mm -hmm. i mean like what we lose track of is you know food is in essence it's a part of our energy system right mm -hmm. you know it helps us create energy it's not the only thing because i think we have four bodies you know mental emotional spiritual and physical mm -hmm. but in the physical body it is part of what makes it work and function and you know, if you're eating the wrong foods, you get the brain fog or the tired or rash, you know, you, you, you with the gluten, you know. Yeah, yeah, celiac disease, it's a whole other, mm -hmm. yeah. So, and that's, you know, and if the body isn't okay with the food, you know, celiac, it's like, yeah, eliminate category or avoid something that isn't working for you. But people are doing it, I'd say, unnecessarily. You know? So you're talking about some of the fad diets, which, of course, have been around forever Ever. and will yeah. probably continue yeah. and but they do they, they have ramped up like next level sort of yeah. you know in terms and they're of they're now kind of touted trendy. as healthy yeah, yeah. because yeah. what was you know back in the 80s 90s as like jane fonda and you know get skinny and, and you know that is now it's like healthy to eat this not eat that eliminate carbs eliminate this high fat yeah, low vegan, protein paleo keto, yeah. the, mm -hmm. you know and it's really creating a lot of confusion i think for people and mm -hmm. The eating is distorted, and then, like I said, it starts to get build momentum, and then they just get mm. too kind of balled up in it. You know, it's like, oh well, should I? Shouldn't I? And you know, tracking all their carbs and and just um, so it really goes. All of those um, come back to the foundation of what is your relationship with food. So mm -hmm. obviously, we need food as a fuel source yeah. for our brain, for our bodies. Mm -hmm. It's a critical part of our species just mm -hmm. developing over time. So when the relationship becomes foggy or clouded mm -hmm. for whatever reason, mm -hmm. um, what happens next? Like, how does it go from I'm trying to decide what's the best thing for me to consume for my athletic needs, for my physical health, mental health, and all that, to this disordered eating? <laughs> where it's no longer, yeah. you know, I'm proactively trying to take care of my health, but yeah. now I'm getting a, a negative relationship yeah. with food. Well, I guess I want to answer that in, in those, I want to turn that question around just a little bit and okay. say when a lot of people come to me, um, if there's clearly a pattern that they're running, right? Like, oh, I'm binging at night uh, or I'm binging purging or I'm, you know, storing food and, you know, something like that. Like there's like a little micro pattern. But I think what I want to open this up to is people's identification with like health and well-being mm. is a little distorted. Like they, okay. they're they they're looking too much to a magazine, a social media, uh, a movie star, wherever the influence, let's say, comes from because we are very externally motivated, you know, visual pictures, body types, mm -hmm. things like that. We say, oh, I want to look like that. Oh, I want, to th I want the six-pack abs or what have you. Mm -hmm. And when we start pursuing something like six-pack abs or – Michelle Obama arms or something like that. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What does this have to do with health? Mm -hmm, you know, what does mm -hmm. this have to do with energy and vitality to live your life? So I think when you, if you find yourself, you know, kind of in that, that rabbit hole, you've gone down a hole and it's like, whoa, what does this have to do with me feeling good? Like I'm no mm -hmm. longer feeling good about this. Mm -hmm. Like you, when you, I know a little bit of your journey, it mm -hmm. was like, I'm not feeling good. I'm not optimized. Like I feel like crap. Sick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like sick and the doctor, what have you. Yeah. That's a huge, you know, that's a huge one. But I would say, too, people get overly consumed with it, you know. And one of the, I just want to put this in here is, um, you know, I talk a lot with women who come to me and they're so black or white, you know, like 100% clean or it's Good not or okay. bad. Yeah. Judgment. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I got to 100% have to have a clean diet. And then there's all this shame because they eat a cookie or they yeah. have some pudding or ice cream or birthday cake or something. Mm -hmm. And it's like, really? Like, you know, my philosophy, and it's not everybody's, but it's more like a 90 10. Mm -hmm. And it's like, 90% of the time, yeah, take great care of this thing. You know, mm -hmm. mental, emotional, physical, all of it. 10%, enjoy those, those moments. Enjoy that thing. 
But going backwards again, a couple steps is how does the switch, what, 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 what's the switch there, right? So like, how does it go from, and I have some disordered eating background too, when mm -hmm. I was younger, junior high and high school, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people experiment with it in those age groups Definitely. tends to be, you know, their peers are doing it or something, yeah. um, want to fit into the skinny jeans, all the things, yeah. but Somewhere there's a switch along the way where our relationship with food and what we put in our mouth mm -hmm. becomes attached to the shame, the judgment, all of those emotional feelings that mm -hmm. we feel like we're taking control right. with that, whatever that element is, right? Doing this diet, that diet. We, we feel like there's a control play there, but then at the same time, there's also um, harm mm -hmm. and really you know, negative, not only talk, but like abuse towards our self and our body. Mm -hmm. What's the switch? I would say for some people, it's a moment, but I would mm -hmm. say for most people, it creeps up on them. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would just say most people, it's like a a, 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 a friend that crept in and they didn't, you know, and then it's mm -hmm. just stuck. You Sneaky know? bastard. Yeah. Yeah. I would say most people, you know, don't remember like when it happened or like, was it a thing or, you know, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the thing I want to point out and not to raise more eating disorder awareness, if you will, mm -hmm. but um, there's people that are having these, you know, we talked about it in the twenties, you know, so my kind of peak, if you will, of when I was the most active in my disordered eating was in my early twenties. Okay. But I see people in their twenties, thirties, forties, fifties. Yeah. It's not an age thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it just it morphs too. Okay. You know, it's a little bit. I think we were talking a little bit earlier about a friend who's you know kind of put down the alcohol, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And if you don't understand what the nature of the disorder was that was creating the call for that alcohol or the extra drinks or you know mm -hmm. what were you what because it's usually food and weight is a symptom of something that's going on with the self. Mm -hmm. So what, what's, what's not okay in here mm -hmm. that's having you reach for this or making this okay? Because I mean, I tell my clients is people who love and really care for themselves don't treat themselves like this. Mm -hmm. Like we don't abuse the body. We don't abuse ourselves. We don't shame ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. when we really love and care for ourselves. So there's something in here that it's a story. It's a belief that I'm not okay, or I need this for love, or this makes me look cool, or something like that. So re-examining that. So the disorder really starts when the relationship with self changes, or is not developed in a compassionate, self-loving way. So there's the distorted relationship, or disordered, could be with other people, mm -hmm. bad relationships, mm -hmm. drugs, alcohol, mm -hmm. food, exercise, you know, mm -hmm. that we're going to talk about some of these things later in the series. but. Mm -hmm. If you think about it as, or I think about it as emotional fitness, these are all aspects of mm -hmm. being emotionally fit, which is body, mind, spirit, you know, feeling healthy and fit together. Mm -hmm. It's not just, so if there's a bad relationship there or a disordered relationship, that has to start with the self. Mm -hmm. It has to come from you first, mm -hmm. even though it might feel like that was an external bad experience I had and I've taken to food or drugs and alcohol or exercise yeah. or some kind of compulsive behavior. Mm -hmm. um, it really starts from within. Yeah. Yeah. And um, oh, that's so powerful because yeah. that means you have the power to change it. Right. And as you titled this so beautifully, it's making peace with food. Mm -hmm. right? right. And so it's in your control. And I tell you, my story for 20 years was this thing is out of control. It's got, you know, this control over me. I can't ah. stop myself, what have you. And I, okay. and I look at it now with hindsight as like I was a bird in a cage and I had the key. Mm. And I didn't, and I didn't know I did, right? And I was locking myself in, locking myself in with story, patterns, isolation, you know, lots of different things. That's a great analogy. Mm -hmm. And but you can, you, you're the bird. You can open the door, and you can set yourself free. So how did you open your door? Well, thankfully, like I said, a friend introduced me to a workshop. It's called the Landmark Forum. I, I write okay. about this yeah, on my blog and stuff like that. Yeah, three days of. Just Intense. Race. Yes. Intensity. Yeah. yeah. It was, Self investment. It was an introduction to personal development. Yeah. I had no idea what consciousness was. I had no idea what my emotions were, the story in my head. I didn't even know I had a, a voice in my head. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? There's a point where they go, that that part of you that hears me now, the one that's listening, goes, oh, What story? And I was like, Oh, how does he know that's in my head? <laughs> and so I just got conscious and I declared, and there's some things that I did following that, but walked out of there and haven't looked back. So. About 16 years ago. And for everybody, it's going to be different. Yes. You know? Absolutely. For everybody, it's going to be different. Whatever creates that 
um, just like the switch that can bring on this kind mm -hmm. of disordered relationship, yeah. it can also be a switch or is yeah. that turns it off and, and has you discover a different path for yourself. And mm. it is a moment of decision. Yeah. It's a moment of decision. Like awareness. Yeah. First. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And most people who come to me already are aware of that. Like it's not yeah. working. Like this isn't working for me anymore. I'm mm -hmm. totally obsessed. I'm totally either destroying my relationships, my body's a wreck or, or whatever is, ha you know, like I'm not leaving my house because I'm so ashamed or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's like a point in time they have to decide, you know, whether they get coaching or they get some counseling or whatever that looks like. But mm -hmm. I call it the enough moment. You know, it's like, <laughs> life sucks, life sucks. And then you go, enough. I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. And how fast that recovery or that, that road back out to feeling good about themselves and taking good care of themselves. That depends, like you said. And when, what that enough moment is, it could be showing, like I had a client one time, ended up in the hospital. You know, mm -hmm. she, she was... You know, getting rid of her food in the toilet, banged her head, passed out, ended up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And she's like, enough. That's pretty, that's pretty a big sign that it's time. Mm -hmm. But other people just, you know, like me, I just chose it. Yeah. I think it's been different for all of us who, you know, are doing this now with our life's work as coaches. We all have a different story, but there definitely was a turning point for all of us where we said, absolutely, enough. Yeah. I'm going to die like this, or I can live completely different, but I have to take back the power and control and build the ne you know, the next level of life. And I think it's work, but yeah. it's worth it. And I think Every part work. of that little seed is remembering that, you know, that we talk about worthiness, the enoughness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm enough. I'm, I'm worth not living like this anymore, mm -hmm. right? And I think the people who don't or keep struggling with it, they don't make that switch inside like, no, this isn't how my life is supposed to turn out. This isn't who I'm supposed to be. Mm. And there were years where I felt like, I don't want to do this. You know, like it was how it felt like it was happening to me. Mm -hmm. and I didn't know the way out of it. So, you know, definitely work with counselors, coaches, people that, or read. You know, there's all sorts of great ways now. You know, when I was recovering, mm -hmm. there was no Internet. You know, it's like, <laughs> no, like we'll believe me, it had barely been around like 10 years that they knew about. Yeah. And, right. So, yeah. yeah. But there's so much information many resources and it's that enough of this I'm, I'm not doing this anymore and then you get about living a life by your design mm -hmm. making peace with yourself and your food a lot of times it takes somebody else to well my experience of being coached and coaching others is someone else who believes in you more than you believe in yourself right. and sees the value in you because maybe you don't see 100 mm -hmm. of that value and you need help discovering it yeah i mean so the support systems are critical and being around the right people. There definitely can be a lot about your environment mm -hmm. that could be feeding the problem, whatever the problem might be. And so really having to explore that. Absolutely. You know, relationships, Absolutely. environment. You know, the success of the 12-step programs, I think partly, I, I'm not a huge, you know, like pushing people towards 12 steps, but one of the foundational things that I think is beautiful in that is that sense of community. Like, mm -hmm. like you're not an oddball here. Like more people are doing this. We're like all, we're all yeah, odd. <laughs> we're all working on stuff. We're all working on different things. We're all things, unique. Right? That's the cool on... thing about it, though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, whether it's a community. So you know, we talk. You know, you and I like mastermind groups, women's circles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, a twelve-step program, a counselor, a coach, or something. But depending on the amount of t life, time this has been in your life and the momentum that it has, like how frequently you're doing this. Because towards the end, for me, you know, from ten times a day. Towards the end, it was you know maybe three to two or three times a week. Mm -hmm. I was having episodes, so um, that's not that's you can break that pattern. It's the ten times a day where you need the most support because it feels like it's running you. Well, let's um, dig into that a little bit. So, if you were talking with one of your clients, and I know you do this coaching, but like, what would be somebody who just comes to you who really they've reached the point enough? I'm ready mm -hmm. to self invest and change this story. Mm -hmm. Where do we start? How do we walk them through that process yeah. of discovering? I would say I start with people and we take the attention off the food okay. unless there's some, like, there's a breakdown in the body. You know, if they're having a health issue, we okay. need to address that, mm -hmm. right? But I really work at the foundation of their self, you know, self identity. The, the, the umbrella that I see in um, recovery, if you will, I don't even like that word, it's like lasting recovery, but it's like living a new life is. Transforming from shame and guilt and self-abuse mm -hmm. yeah. to self-compassion. Yeah. Because when they can make the switch to start seeing themselves worthy and then they're okay and they can do anything underneath that umbrella, like 
you fall down, you get back up. You know, a baby's trying to walk, you know, how long do you give a baby to walk? Until it walks. You don't say like, get up, dummy. You got you three know. tries. Yeah, all right, done, done, right? <laughs> you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> like, no. The well, same with this is don't expect a straight line. And it, you know, mine was, yeah. Yeah. mine was like 20 years, like I was done, done, done. Some, some people quit smoking like right away and some people have to gradually, you know, Mm -hmm. peel themselves away from it whatever it's like an old friend or mm -hmm. what have you whatever that looks like but start with self-compassion so we work on their relationship with their self and find mm -hmm. out so some people you know with disordered eating it's a, a coping mechanism so i say yeah. they're like feeding their feelings yeah you talk about emotional fitness girl oh yeah mm -hmm. yeah they haven't learned that like what's going on in their body where it's coming from how to deal with it mm -hmm. how to not turn to food for that because food you know that i think the one thing that makes um food strugg struggles with food is still got to live with it you exactly can't, you can't go like oh i don't want this drink yeah, anymore it's not i'm not going to drink i'm not going to smoke i'm not going to do whatever this harmful behavior this is unnecessary because you thing. still have to have nutrition is something yeah. that's critical for all of our lives yeah so it's rebuilding a new relationship with food or mm -hmm. rebuilding the old relationship you had before you so you have to really unpack the old stuff in order to create the new habits. Some. I wouldn't say that, you know, I don't totally follow the therapy model. Of like, let's go into what all this happened and, you know, mm -hmm. dig it all out. Not necessarily. Because the more clear we can be, like, where are you now and where do you want to go? That's what my job as a coach is and yours, too. It's like, oh, yeah. you want to run a marathon. Okay, well, how, how much are you running now? None. Okay, well, <laughs> there's a gap. <laughs> Starting at one. Let's, let's, let's see what we can do to close that gap. And it doesn't yeah. mean you look at, well, how long have you not been running? <laughs> mm -hmm. it's like yeah has no bearings like well, I, haven't, I haven't been running but here's where i am so most of the focus is here some sometimes there is some work to understand something that may be causing some of the patterns just to see if things are you know i work a lot in neuroassociation and see if things need to be broken up right mm -hmm. so we get a lot of the people tie treats to you know reward right mm. like oh i was a good girl like they they link oh up. a lot of us were raised that way right oh yeah the treat thing mm -hmm. is huge. like I deserve a treat. Yeah, you know, I deserve mm -hmm. a treat today, and that's not bad. It's just know that that exists, and it's yeah. either running you or you're in charge of it, and you get to decide. My worth isn't judged upon if I was a good girl today or mm -hmm. if I deserve this kind of thing. It's like mm -hmm. have that cookie, but don't make it like directly know. associated with I had to perform X Y Z in order to yeah. earn that. Because then you're a slave to it. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Hypnotherapy is one of the tools. I know you use a lot of different tools. Can you speak about that a little bit? Another long, you know, I'm like, <laughs> I got my little toolbox yes. here. So I would say the... Because everybody needs something different. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's, you know, I, I watch, I'm a huge fan of Tony Robbins and in his conferences, he does these things called interventions. And as I watch him, super masterful. I mean, the man can read psychology like like nobody else. But what we find is, um, like you said, like I have some clients right now that just they're younger, millennial mindset, and they're trying a lot of these um, drugs. Um, like Hallucinogens. Yeah, and stuff. Mm -hmm. to see if that can help with the, the rewiring and stuff. And they're having good success with it. So mm -hmm. it depends. So for me, you know, 16, about 16 years ago, I started working in this world on myself. Mm -hmm. And so that was the journey. It was like, how do I understand what's going on for me? How do mm -hmm. I be... The best me not you know the superstar whatever like the best self that i can be and take care of where my emotional fitness was was lacking because mm -hmm. i was raised by people who weren't emotionally fit well exactly i mean and a lot of us have been and were you know and that's just part of the life cycle and it doesn't mean that that casts yeah. our fate forever and that's our story and we Absolutely. have to be living with that experience you know it's part of who we are and i know we both believe really strongly in the fact that all of the things that it, we've experienced over our lifetime make us the person we are today. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, no regrets going all in on being the best person we can be today and moving forward. Yeah. But sometimes there's some hard learnings yeah. and <laughs> some you hard know, knocks. Our parents modeled one thing and maybe our friends or our peers modeled something, but you mm -hmm. can still learn new ways. You know? Yeah. Like we, you know, it's not, you know, teaching old dogs new tricks they can't learn. Yeah. Yeah. We still can. We can mm -hmm. still rewire this. We can make a lot of changes. So hypnotherapy, definitely. I was driven to that or right? like it was part of my path if you mm -hmm. will just kept wanting to find more ways because I know at the root of the eating because eating is a behavior right and what's all behavior is rooted in thought or belief 
Yeah. And so I was like, how do I help people with the belief? Because, you know, I can teach them food mood journals, how to like not, you know, tie their food to all this stuff. But I was like, but it's how they're thinking. I knew mm. that the thinking needed to be reworked. I knew the belief system, what got them there, their self-identity was where the change needed to happen if it was going to sustain. So I just started studying, how do you do belief change? How do you do, you know, where, where are the roots of belief change? And that just led me closer and closer to hypnotherapy. And another one is neuro-linguistic programming or NLP. Mm -hmm. Both fantastic strategies. And there's others, but fantastic ways to help people at that root change what they believe about something or how they see something so that they can have a new life. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you change the way you see something, the way what you look at changes. Mm -hmm. You change your story. Well, it's your whole relationship. So if we're talking specifically about food and you have a particular relationship with food or how you associate to it, if you've dieted your whole life and all of those kind of things, you have to really change that deep rooted core belief yeah. about you and how you perceive food. Mm -hmm. So, and surprisingly, that's where, you know, when you were asking about like, how do people make this change? Yeah. It's that change when mm -hmm. that changes. And, you know, I, I want to like lighten it a little bit, that deep rooted, like, oh, that's never coming out. Well, it's just because it's got a lot of momentum. It's just because okay. it's been, um, you know, a belief is just a thought you keep thinking over mm -hmm. and over and over again. And then, you, and then you find evidence for it in the world. And the mind goes, okay, that's true. Mm. And so belief change is about finding the lies in the things that you, yeah. you believe, right? It's like, yeah, that's good. oh, well, maybe I'm not always this way. Or maybe mm -hmm. I'm, you know, maybe I am a good person. Maybe I can take care of myself. Maybe whatever, something you're telling yourself about food. We have beliefs in ourselves, the world, and the way people are, right? Mm. So what do you believe about yourself that may be causing those behaviors? These behaviors, yeah. And it's not like this deep root, like, it'll never go away. It's mm -hmm. more, I've just thought that for so long and I've seen so much of myself doing it you know so I had 20 years of being that repeated way repeated loop <laughs> yeah and I'll, you have I'll to just, break the loop I'll throw this in so at 20 years I had literally walked into the landmark forum and my thought where it was um, resigned I was like I literally think in the weeks leading up to it I just had said and I, I wasn't going to the landmark forum for eating this you know to, to stop my bulimia that's mm -hmm. not why I it's was a leadership program yeah mm -hmm. it's business leadership and I just was like it came out of it but wow. it wasn't why I went into it I just mm -hmm. was like oh what is this thing that my friend has changed her life with let me go try this but it um oh, I lost my train of thought there but the belief changed you know? yeah you resigned when you walked in the room something in your mindset yeah and and then the story in my mind was well I guess I'll just live like this oh and then in that room of 150 souls I saw wow, this guy had lived like this for all his life. Yeah. And, and he, in that workshop, he changed something. And then she did. And she forgave this person. And she got over this trauma in her life. And I went, well, if these people can do it, then, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the possibility was awakened in me. Mm -hmm. That's how I look at that. Because walking into that, my mindset was so 20 years. This is how it is. This is who you are. Yeah. This is the way it's always going to be. There's no possibility. I've tried everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in that weekend I saw a possibility again I said darn it if anything I want is possible then I want this mm. and I declared it and and, and off I went and yeah. lived into that new belief right yeah well and so that leads us to now which is you've changed your entire career path you're no longer you know doing a lot of things you were doing so tell us mm -hmm. what you're up to now so hypnotherapy is um it's it's a part of my coaching I would say mm -hmm. you know um I, I was I was I think I was a little naive thinking that, I mean, I'm open to it. I'm like, hey, like, I'll try anything. I'm like, I've tried it. I'm like, yeah, yes, that's cool. Or, you know, I've tried aura readings. I've tried, you know, lots of different strategies just because. Well, we're self-learners, but we learned for the first half of our life that, you know, we weren't that person. Yeah. And um, we discover so much about ourselves trying new things yeah. Yeah. and challenging our belief systems and evolving. Mm -hmm. It's part of, a bit, you know, evolution. Mm -hmm. But. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, so you're coaching others with all these tools. You have a whole toolbox there. Yeah, and, you know, to go into what the specifics are, um, I would just kind of blanket statement say um, my expertise is habits and addictions. Mm -hmm. So people, and so habits are just patterns, right? They're patterns of behavior that are because of patterns of thought. The way you see yourself, the way you see the world, oh, this is the way it always is. You know, like you never have money because, well, you're, you know, you see yourself as never having money, right? Mm -hmm. Or you you overeat or, you, or you're in a relationship where people treat you badly. Mm -hmm. That's how you self-identify. So 
helping people with breaking patterns in different areas of their life where they, they, and people come to me and they know they're the cause, you know, they're <laughs> like, I know I'm doing, you know, like they'll shake their head um, because that's where hypnotherapy is the best because the behavior, the letting a man, you know, abuse you or neglect you, letting yourself uh, abuse yourself with food, mm -hmm. um, drinking too much, you know, whatever those things are. It's like, why do I continue to do this? Because I walk into my office and they're like in a total conscious state. I don't know why I'm doing this. Like, mm -hmm. uh, like this doesn't make any sense. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, whether they their friends know about it or the eating is like kind of behind the scenes, like I'm sneaking all this food or, you know, what have you. Um, they know that there's something out of whack and that there's like this broken relationship they have. Well, it's actually just a broken mental program. You know, mm -hmm. they feel like they're at odds with themselves. I got this monster that wants me to eat and binge and or what have you. Or why do I go back to this guy when he's just not mm -hmm. good for me and stuff? And that's where... That speaks to me so loudly of some miswiring, some misprogramming. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. So in that case, it's like, okay, got, I got something for that. <laughs> well, I think that's because at the core of all of our belief systems is we are born knowing mm -hmm. that we're completely worthy. Yeah. And, sure. you know, that there is that possibility for us. And then over lifetime and experiences, that messaging changes. So the people that are walking into the door now really know at their, you know, root of who they are is mm -hmm. that is they're worthy of being happy, healthy, of having mm -hmm. all the things that they want in their life, of having mm -hmm. good relationships. But, you know, life happens. Mm -hmm. And so repeatedly, a lot of us, speaking about myself, yeah. have to be routinely schooled to relearn that lesson. Yeah. And luckily, most of us do learn that lesson, and I hope that we all do, because that's the truth, right? That's mm -hmm. the truth of humanity. Mm -hmm. And you help them rediscover that then. Yeah, mm -hmm. and what's beautiful is, you know, because I've done so much work with you know, food problems and struggles that people have with food, whether it's, you know, categories of food or dieting or they're over-exercising or they're in the bulimia category or what have you, mm -hmm. that's a beginning of the coaching, but, mm. you know, really it's helping them re rebuild a relationship with self yeah. and then they're like okay well if I can do this here let's go let, like because that's just one area yeah, of my life yeah right yeah. I mean yeah. not naturally some other areas get better but you know because I'm a success coach and I, I understand how this wheel of life in their life works like yeah you do better with your health and then your relationships will improve you you'll, you'll be more passionate about your work because you're feeling better about yourself and you know all these areas so the yeah. coaching can go on to other areas and happy to do that. You know, I just want people to live their best life. Right? Yeah. Like you, like out adventuring, whatever that yeah. looks like. Yeah. That's why we hang out a lot. Yeah. 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 So let's wrap this up. Let's tell people a little bit, maybe some closing thoughts on making mm -hmm. peace with food. Anything mm -hmm. you want to drive home in terms of a message? Anything to drive home. Um, I think a little bit of what we've talked about, like you are creating this. You know, I love that you call this making peace with food because I would also say making peace with yourself, mm, you know, okay. so make peace with yourself, bring that level of compassion back to whatever it is you're doing, because um, there's a distortion in our culture that says, um, when I uh, kind of whip or beat you, you'll, you'll perform better, right? Mm. So a lot of girls, a lot of women come to me, they were in athleticism or they were in sports or school Relationship. or something something and it was like it's all about the like the coach beat them to run faster or climb harder or something like that and so they have this they've taken that on on themselves and so they just beat themselves up so badly that mm. there's no room for self-compassion and self-love so it's like letting go you know making peace is like well what am I not at peace with right? I'm not at peace with myself and so how am I creating this angst or this um, resistance inside of myself that I can rebuild that relationship and be like well, that's okay, because I fundamentally believe when somebody loves, appreciates, respects themselves, they will start to find the way, you mm -hmm. know, whatever that is. If it's a therapist, if it's 12-step, if it's these hallucinogens, whatever it is, that core, that decision that starts to be like, you know what, I don't want to live like this, and I'm worth it. And then they give themselves back that compassion along the way. Because um, it's going to be messy. Like, <laughs> Life is messy. Yeah. So be okay with that. Awesome. Awesome. That's so beautiful. Thank yeah. you. How can people get in touch with you? Where can they find you? Yeah, I think the best way is from my website, which is my name. So it's pollymertens.com. P-O-L-L-Y-M-E-R-T-E-N-S.com. And from there, you know, they can 
find email you on social, me. Yeah. chat you up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I my my name is my social handle on just about everything. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank thanks you. for sharing the morning with me. And thank you for the opportunity to be here to share this and for the work that you do. I mean, I, I know what a gifted coach you are and the, mm. the message and the meaning that you're trying to bring to people to help light them up, get them on their path. So thank you for A, we're doing it together. Being the model that you are too, because you model mm. like, don't just give in, don't just sit on the couch, don't just give up, don't just, you know, settle, if you mm -hmm. will. And you're you're not settling and n nobody needs to. So thank you. We just won't, will we? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, and that's a wrap. You can find us at Endurance Town USA, and you can find me personally at the Samantha Pruitt on Instagram and samanthapruitt.com online. Okay, darling, that was great. Yay! Thank you for connecting with us for this episode of the Endurance Town USA project. Discover more about today's guest, along with other great stories and video projects, by visiting us online at endurancetownusa.com. You can also follow us for updates and behind the scene peeks at future episodes on Instagram at endurancetownusa. You can also connect with our creator, host, and life leadership and business coach, Samantha Pruitt, at samanthapruitt.com or on Instagram at the Samantha Pruitt. And lastly, you can follow me, Travis Ford, producer and marketing creative at rockharbormarketing.com or Instagram at Rock Harbor Market. Thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you next time we go on an adventure to Endurance Town, USA. Bring it back.